Ephesians. So if you brought your Bible, and I hope you did, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And as you begin turning to that chapter, let me ask you a question. Does anyone find faith, not pastor faith, (laughs) difficult? Do you ever find growing in your faith? difficult. Pastor Glenn, do you ever find growing the church of God difficult, or is it just cake and cookies all the time? Do you ever ask yourself why it's so hard? I mean, there's a lot of answers. But the prime reason That faith is difficult. That growing in faith is difficult. Is because there is an enemy that wants to derail you and wants to derail every church that preaches the name of Jesus Christ. Because that enemy knows that in the end, he is defeated, but he wants to create as much havoc as possible. He wants to keep as many people as possible from hearing the name of Jesus. He wants to disrupt. He wants to lie. He wants to cheat. He wants to steal the faith from you if he could. We are in a battle. I hope you know that. Now, I don't say that to scare us, because I know who wins. But it is true. Every one of us is in a battle every day. This church, my church, our brothers' churches, our sisters' churches are in a battle every single day because the enemy wants to do anything that he can to disrupt, derail, get off track, confuse the church of Jesus Christ. And we better know how to take them on. And Paul, in this incredible letter, I mean, it's just an incredible letter, winds down his letter by giving us some of the most honest statements about the enemy, and more importantly, what we can do to survive his attacks. No, even more than survive, what we can do to find victory and advance for the kingdom, even though the enemy tries to attack us. So, like I said, I may have bitten off more than I can chew, but I'd like to take us through Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 through 20 in the hour and a half the pastor has given me. So, so great. So if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin reading. I want you to hear it all. I know you've heard it. Some of you probably have it memorized. But I want you to hear it again. Paul writes, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Paul writes, finally... Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit 
on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, Paul writes, that whenever I speak words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Why is faith so difficult? Because the enemy is trying to do whatever he can to disrupt you. He is going to lie to you. He is going to war against you. He is going to prowl around and find someone who's having a weak moment so he can pounce. He's going to try to deceive you and to lead you into wrong thinking and error. He is called the father of lies because he's been a liar from the very beginning. Do you realize the first time he shows up, he lies? And he's been lying ever since. He's a false accuser. And he is the enemy of our God. And Paul says in verses 11 and 12, we are to put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. He is scheming. And he goes on to say, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul understands that in the, the heavenly realms, in the order of things, that we are battling not flesh and blood. We are battling against the enemy and his minions. Do you ever wonder why Paul might remind us that our battle is not against flesh and blood? When I preach through this text in my church, I spend a lot of time trying to wonder, why would Paul have to say that? And I think it's because, by and large, we see with earthly eyes. I mean, that's what God has given us. So when we see trouble coming, we see some human being or some system right there. But Paul is reminding us that behind what's happening in the earthly realm is this, I was going to use a word I shouldn't use, enemy who is manipulating and trying to get his way. I've just spent four weeks in Nigeria where I teach at a seminary. We did a lot of prayer ministry with people uh, that my wife works with, and there was just a lot of, of, you know, God stuff going on there. You might know about Nigeria. It's been in the news a little bit lately with the 300 girls that were kidnapped, what, about six, eight weeks ago. I've lost time now. Um, one of the people we ministered to was a brother of one of those girls. And he was talking to us about forgiving enemies. Get that. But see, it's so easy to think that the group Boko Haram is the enemy. And of course, that gets multiplied in Nigeria into saying Muslims are the enemy. But they're not the real enemy. The enemy is this satanic devil who has blinded the eyes of those who are Muslim and caused them to think they are being faithful by kidnapping 300 girls or by blowing up 52 people in a market who happened to be shopping that day. And they have been blinded by this enemy. It's that enemy that we need to go after, not the local ones. But what we see so often is just the human element. And we can begin to think they're the enemy. And Paul is reminding us it's not them. It's not the flesh and blood. It's the devil behind them who has cloaked them in darkness and has led them astray. 
Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces who are hell-bent to keep the church from doing what God has called us to do, which is reach the nations for Jesus. But we know who wins. And our struggle can and will be fierce. Some translations use the word struggle. Some translations use the word wrestle. I connect with the word wrestle because my youngest son was a wrestler in Greenwich High until he graduated last year. And I love that sport. It is incredible. There is six minutes of all-out intensity. It's fantastic. But when we think of wrestling like that, it has very little to do with what Paul's talking about. See, wrestling back then, even Olympic wrestling back in Paul's day, only had two rules. You could not gouge out the opponent's eye and you could not bite them. Beyond that, you could do anything you wanted. And one of the great heroes of the Olympic game wrestler was a person who had a move where he would literally break the fingers of the people and he won three Olympics in a row by getting them in a handhold and then just start breaking their fingers until he put them down. There were no no rules. This enemy who is fighting against us does not have any rules. And if, by chance, Paul is thinking about warfare, are there rules in war? Not really. If it's me or you, I am going to do anything I can to preserve me and to get rid of you. And that's what Paul is trying to point us to. It is fierce struggle. This is not just a game. This is not, you know, oh... You know, I'm having a rough day. My fingernail broke. (laughs) Can't do a thing with my hair. He is out to get us. And he will lie and he will cheat. And he will do anything he can. Now, we don't have to worry that we're always in a battle. It's always a possibility. But life isn't defined by the battle. War is not the father of all things. But a battle can come at any time. And so we have to constantly be ready. And that's really where Paul is going. He reminds us who we're fighting so that he can tell us God has prepared a defense for us. And the beautiful part of it is it's far more than just a defense, but we'll get to the offense part in a few minutes. So I want to walk us through the armor that God provides for us And I want to do it in a a fun way by by giving you some visuals so that hopefully you will associate those visuals in the future with the various pieces of armor that God has given to you and to me. And Paul uses as an example the Roman armor. And, you know, I got this great picture Rome in Paul's day was at its height militarily. It was the most feared army on the planet at the time. And one of the factors that made the Roman army so great was that about two centuries before Christ, the Senate passed a law that they were going to outfit every soldier with the same equipment. And the state was going to provide that. Now, we expect that in our armies. 
But that was radical thinking back then, and it allowed so much to happen because now every soldier could be trained with the same equipment. And those who controlled the army knew that every legion had this equipment. And every legion then could be taught the same tactics in battle. So if they had to call in other legions in a fight, they knew how those legions would react in the battle. And it was an incredible military strategy. And then if something advanced, you got a better kind of sword, a better kind of shield, it could take time. But they could get that throughout the entire army. So the army was always best equipped. Now the neat part is Paul uses the Roman army to tell us about what God has given to us. And God has outfitted every one of us with the same armor. The question is, are we putting it on? It's not if we have it. God's given it to us. He has supplied it. He's the Roman Senate. He has said, every one of my children has every one of these pieces of armor. The question is, are you putting it on? And are you using it effectively? So what I want to do for the rest of this evening is to just talk a little bit about the Roman army and the Roman armor. And the first piece is one you can't even see in the diagram. Paul calls it the belt of truth. Let's see if I can... Yeah, I'll just do it like this. Now... If I had, you can go to the next slide. The basic clothing in Rome was something called a tunic. Not great fashion in my thought, but that's pretty high fashion in the Roman day and all the drapings and how nicely they look. But look at the guy in the center. Notice how far down the tunic goes. All of the tunics, even the one for the person, the two people on the outside, are about that long. The difference is, are they held up by a belt? If you want to know what a Roman tunic is, next slide. There it is. Just go and get the largest trash bag you can, cut out a hole for the head, cut out a hole for the arms, and you have a Roman tunic. In fact, when I preached this in my church, I wore one, a trash bag tunic for about three minutes because it was way too hot. (laughs) But there's no way you you can go into battle if you have something down around your ankles. So the first thing that a Roman soldier had to do was he had to put on his inner belt. Paul calls it the belt of truth. And he puts the word truth at the end because he's emphasizing the fact that it's the belt of truth. So I brought my belt with me. And I purposely didn't put it on before I came. Because I want you to think every morning when you get up, I know I have a belt loop somewhere, and you put your belt on, or if you're a woman and you put a sash on, or you put anything on around your waist like this. I want you to think about the belt of truth. I didn't want to go up. That's okay. Oh, there he goes. Great. I want you to think of the belt of truth because that is the foundational piece to the Roman armor. It may not sound like much. It was just a small leather belt. But because of that belt, the soldier could pull the tunic up so that it was around knee length. He could tuck it into his belt. So now he was free to be able to go to battle. If he did not do that, most of the other armor wouldn't be any help because he'd have this thing around his ankles that would certainly get him into trouble. The belt of truth is foundational. Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Truth. 
Now, Paul could have linked anything he wanted to the belt. He could have called it the belt of salvation. He could have called it the belt of prayer in the Spirit. But he said the foundational element is the truth. And what do you think he is driving at? What is the foundational element for us in the church? See, I think he's talking about the belt of truth, capital T. Put on your belt of the truth, the word of God. Paul is, in effect, instructing the Ephesians that their base defense is all right here. The sad reality in churches today is that brothers and sisters are run over and flattened. They are chewed up and spit out. They are trampled on by the enemy because they do not know the word of God. When Jesus was in the wilderness, when he had his face-to-face encounter with the evil one, what did he constantly go to as his defense? Scripture. The enemy knows the scripture and tried to twist it on Jesus, but he knew it and he could use it back. Brothers and sisters, I plead with you to know this book. Come here on Wednesday nights. Bask in the preaching on Sunday. Go to Sunday school. But keep your nose in the book. Because if you don't keep your nose in the book, none of the other armor is going to help. Please, I plead with you. Understand that God's word is the truth that is our best protection and our base foundation against the enemy. Put the truth into daily practice in your life. Gird your loins, buckle your life around the truth of God's word. But I think there's a second element to it. I think Paul is also saying that we are to put on the belt of truth as in truthfulness. See, if the Word of God is really getting into us, then it's going to come out of us in the way we live. And you're going to see this over and over again as we look at the armor. And God wants us to live truthful lives. When we live outside of truth, we get in all kinds of trouble. And what does the enemy do then? He just comes in and he just squeezes us. How many ministries have fallen and been ruined because of some kind of duplicity of integrity? And then the leader gets exposed. How many marriages have been destroyed by the duplicity of unfaithfulness? Someone trying to be not truthful in their relationship with their spouse. How many families have been ruined by some member in the family who's been lying and cheating? And think of friendships. How gossip untruthfulness can destroy a friendship and create jealousy in someone. God is calling us to be people of the truth and he's calling us to be truthful people in all our relationships. Put on the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now again, 
I want you to think about any time you put a sweater on. You put something on over something else. I want you to think about that being the breastplate of righteousness. Just a reminder for you. Many of the women have a, have a jacket on in here. Slip your arm in, breastplate of righteousness. Put a scarf around your neck, breastplate of righteousness. Because that's the next piece. First of all, notice what it covers. It covers all of our internal organs, those parts of our body that are precious. Righteousness. You, of course, know that when you come to Jesus Christ, he puts upon us his righteousness so that when we stand before the Father, the Father doesn't see us in our sinful self, but he sees us through Jesus Christ, and therefore he sees us with the righteousness of Jesus. Are you really walking with Jesus? Have you been adopted into his kingdom? Have you been saved? Have you been born again? Do you really know God through Jesus Christ? Put on that breastplate of righteousness. But again, it's not simply the gift of righteousness that God gives us. He's also calling us to live righteously. In other words, to live rightly among other people. Are your relationships the right kind of relationships? Are you committed to living God-honoring ways with your life? Are you committed to living God-honoring ways in your community with your friends? Every time you make the choice to do what is right, you are tightening, cinching the breastplate of righteousness around you. And when we don't have that on, think of the havoc the enemy can wreak in our lives. He's just looking for a little opening. And then our, we are to stand firm with our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Shoes fitted with the gospel of peace. The Romans developed a, a different kind of footwear. I wore the sandals partly because they were open-toed shoes that they laced up their ankle and then up their calf. But on the bottom, it would look like nails nailed in. They, they looked like um, soccer shoes or cleats or football cleats. And they were designed for two reasons. One, so that over the Roman roads, those men could march hours upon hours. If they needed to get somewhere, you know, they couldn't hop in a Humvee and get there. They marched. But the other reason, it was so that they would have traction. So that when they were having to push the wall forward, their feet would not slip. And they knew that the brother standing next to them had the same kind of shoes on, and they knew that that man's feet would not slip. And so they could advance step by step when the fighting got fierce because of the shoes. And Paul calls them the gospel of peace. Are you able? Are you able and comfortable to share the gospel of peace with somebody else? If you're living rightly and your neighbor notices your life's a little different than everyone else around, if you're living truthfully and your neighbor goes, wow, you're living a little different, and they come up to you and say, how come you live like you do when everyone else lives like they do, can't you share with them the peace you have in Jesus? Are your feet fitted 
with the gospel of peace? Are you willing to sacrifice in order to give the gospel of peace away? Those soldiers would march hour upon hour at the command of their superior. Will you march for Jesus in order to give the gospel away? And then the shield of faith. Now, I, I tried to think of what would be a shield. If you're a, if you're a blondie like me, maybe the shield of faith should just be sunscreen because if I go out in the sun for too long without it I'm gonna look red and not feel good the next day but maybe that doesn't work for you maybe you're blessed with the kind of skin that doesn't need to worry but maybe you want to think of the shield let's see if we can open this oh there it is come on open up ah, well. you know what it looks like and you could think of an umbrella my whole point is that I'm just simply trying to give you a visual. So if you're a blondie like me, every time you put on sunscreen, every time you put on a shirt to protect you from the sun, I want you to think about the shield of faith. We're going to have a lot of rain possibly tonight. When you open that umbrella, I want you to think about the shield of faith. The Roman shield was about this tall and about two and a half feet wide, and it was layered wood. And then it was covered with um, leather, and then it had metal around the edges. And before a battle, brilliant Roman strategy, they would take those shields and they would soak them in water so that the two or three layers of what we would call plywood would just be saturated with water. Now, I'm sure that shield was heavy as all get out, but guess what? A favored weapon of the enemies of Rome were what? Fiery arrows. And guess what happens when the shield protected you? When that fiery arrow went into that soaked shield, the arrow went out. What does Paul say? In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith. It's one of those words that we often connect with thoughts and beliefs and propositions and, and what I believe. But faith understood best is really a verb. It's an action. Think of Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah, when he was warned about things, built an ark. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later go, obeyed. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months, by faith, the prostitute Rahab welcomed the spies. Faith has an action part to it. Now, here's the deal. If we really have faith in God, it will protect us from what? Those fiery darts of the enemy. And some of those darts we call doubts. God speaks to you in worship about a brother or a sister that, you know, you have a break in the relationship with. And God says, you need to try to make amends. You need to try to reconcile. And what happens? Before worship is over, all of a sudden, you know, doubts flood in. Man, I've been there. Oh, they're not going to want to receive me back. Wait, I have to forgive them for what they did to me? And all those doubts come in, and it starts to squeeze out the call of God upon our life. But 
faith if we hold on to it, is what will repel those doubts. And the faith will rise up within us and say, no, God is asking me to make that phone call. I'm going to go home, and I am going to reach for the phone, and I'm going to dial that number, and I'm going to see if reconciliation is possible. You're sitting here in worship, and God says, it's time to learn to tithe. Yeah. You know, that sounds really good until you look at the, the, you know, the pay stub and you think, I moved the decimal over one dot? Yeah. And doubts start to come in. And that's the enemy throwing those fiery darts, just saying, ah, you can't really do that. There's no way you can survive that. But faith. The faith of Noah and the faith of Abraham says, no, wait a minute. God has spoken. God will see me through. And we raise that shield of faith and we extinguish those firing darts so that we can actually write out that check. That's the kind of faith that Paul is saying is our shield. And the Romans, by the way, were an incredible machine. They were a war machine because they could put their shields together. And the first row would put their four foot by two and a half foot shields together like this, and it was if you had a solid row in front of you. And then the second row would raise their shields like this, and it would cover the first and cover them. And it was almost as if this army was what we would call an armored vehicle. Because they could go into places behind that shield that you couldn't go alone. There's a blessing of faith in the body of Christ. There's a blessing that says when we talk with one another, when we walk with one another, when we fellowship with one another, we can actually multiply our faith together so that the end result is bigger than the faith of any individual person. The church can become that armored vehicle for Jesus if we will hold the faith of Jesus high and stay behind it. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. And then the helmet of salvation. Now, their helmet was this huge bronze thing, but I'm just going to put a hat on. Now, I like hats. Hope it's okay to wear one inside for tonight. But anytime you put on a hat, anytime you put on a bandana, maybe you put on an even cooler hat. Ta-da! Sorry, Red Sox fans, I get to preach. No. But whenever you put on a hat, a bandana... I want you to think about the helmet of salvation. Do you realize the gift God has given to you in salvation? Oh, my goodness. I mean, just thinking about the eternity part is, is like mind-blowing. That God's preparing a place for all of us for all of eternity. We live here 80, 90 years. But then just multiply zero upon zero upon zero upon zero after that because we're going to live forever in the glory of the king. That's part of our salvation. But it doesn't wait till then. It happens right now. Do you know the blessing of Jesus Christ with you? That's part of the salvation gift he gives you. And when we put on the salvation, it protects our head. It watches over our mind. It reminds us that we know there is a security in Jesus Christ. Put on the helmet of salvation. John was so strong on that. He wrote his gospel so that people would know they have eternal life. That's the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit. Now, it's getting good. Thankful for boys who like toys. The sword of the Spirit. And this is kind of what a Roman sword looked like. Now, I'll tell you, when I was studying the text, 
This is where I had my great aha. Because I assumed, because it said the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that it was again Paul talking about the Word, the Bible. Guess what? It's not. See, the word for word isn't logos, it's rhema. It's the spoken word. It's the proclaimed word. The sword of the Spirit is the proclaimed word of God. When we advance proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's when the enemy gets defeated. That's when the enemy gets scared. And that's part of our armor. The word of God proclaimed. And by the way, folks, it's not just Glenn's job. It's not just the pastor's job. Yes, what we do Wednesday nights and Sunday morning, our proclamation of the word. But the armor is for everybody. You may not be called to preach. That's okay. You'd put us out of a job. But you're called still to be a proclaimer. Remember? The gospel shoes. Can you share the faith with other people? See, what advances the gospel is when proclamation happens. And it's proclamation so that the whole world will know. I, I loved your little deal, you know. Answered prayer for the nations. Don't ever get rid of that word nations. Because that's where we're called to go. And if our eyes aren't lifted that high, we're never going to be able to take the local ground either. You know? When I'm driving in my car, I am driving right here, but my eyes are down the road. By keeping my eyes down the road, I actually can function right here. By remembering that we are called to go to the nations, we don't forget about Greenwich. We just live through Greenwich to the world. God is calling us to lift up the name of Jesus, and it is part of the armor he has given us. It is the sword. That is the proclamation of the word. Hallelujah. Don't ever forget that. And then, pray in the Spirit. But let me just read verses 18 through 20. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, Paul writes, that whenever I speak the words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Do you notice? Paul does not associate Spirit-empowered prayer with any part of the armor. Now, I don't know why. He didn't tell us. But I have a hunch. I think Paul didn't associate it with any part of physical armor. Because prayer is so otherworldly. It's so beyond anything that can happen in this human realm that he didn't want to restrict it by calling it the spear or calling it this or calling it that. Because when we enter prayer, we are actually connecting with heaven, with the armies of God. And we are calling upon the God of this universe to come and be active here in the midst of our world. It is the most powerful tool we have to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is prayer empowered by the Spirit. And it absolutely means, you know, prayer in tongues, prayer in your prayer language, however you want to say it. But I don't believe it is limited to that. I think it's any kind of prayer that is really calling upon God to empower that moment. When we have our prayer teams and we train our prayer teams, I often train our prayer teams 
before you start praying, after you've talked to the person and whatever, before you start the verbal out loud prayer for them, take a moment. And in that moment, call out to God and ask God to turn your thoughts and your words into his thoughts and his words. And I have seen over and over again how then those prayers become spirit-empowered prayers that just blow away the evil that's happening in the life with the person. I remember watching a video about Uganda. I believe it was under the Idi Amin uh, regime. And that was just a terrible time. And the soldiers would just go through, you know, villages and just massacre people or, or cart the kids away, the boys especially, and turn them into more soldiers. And it was just a horrific, horrific time. And finally, a group of women said enough. And they started by putting their families to bed at night. And then the women of the village would, instead of going to sleep themselves, they would get up and they would go into the bush where they wouldn't be disturbed. And they began travailing in prayer. And that turned the tide. That is spirit-empowered prayer. And it is our greatest weapon. Brothers and sisters, spirit-empowered prayer is an incredible gift. And it's, it's so vast and wide and wonderful. I have a slide as I read verse 18. Just notice all of the alls. Paul says, and pray in the spirit on all all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert always, literally all times. Keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's the kind of spirit-empowered prayer he is calling us to. That's the kind of prayer that will move mountains that will shake the very throne of the devil and rip him off it. That's the kind of prayer that will move the church into kingdom advance. And why are we praying? I think Paul gives us a glimpse in his next paragraph. You can go to the next slide there. Pray also for me so that whenever I speak words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. When you're praying for your staff, pray that prayer. Pray that they will fearlessly declare the mysteries of God. When you're praying for your brother or sister or your friend in the church, pray that they will fearlessly declare the mysteries of God. When you pray for yourself, pray that you will fearlessly declare the gospel. Because, brothers and sisters, that's how we win. Or better, that's how God wins. You can sit here, and you can be the kind of Christians who just soak up you know, good preaching and teaching and wonderful worship week after week. Or you can enter the battle. God has given you and me everything we need from the belt of truth to prayer in the Spirit.
and everything in between. The question is, will we use it for the glory of God, for the advancement of the kingdom? I call you to stand alongside your leaders. to take the word to Greenwich, to take the word to Stanford, to take the word to Westchester, to take the word around the world. And the only way that will happen is if we all, every day, put on the full armor of God. Let me pray for you. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray for those in the church I serve. I pray for those in the churches of my friends who are, who are leading the charge for Jesus. I pray that we would understand the gift you have given us in the armor of God. And that we would put all of it on every day so that we are ready at every moment when the Spirit calls to go. I pray, Lord, especially that we would keep the sword honed, that we would know how to express the name of Jesus in regular conversations and I just try to imagine Greenwich if the churches where people know Jesus just dot their conversations with Jesus, what it would be like in our town, what it would be like in this community. And I pray, Lord, that you would build us all to be a praying people who call out through the Spirit's power the advancement of God. So I pray blessing, Lord God, on friends here, on my brother in ministry. And I pray a special dose of blessing upon Glenn that you would fill him. And that, Lord, as he gives out here, and around the world that he would never be empty because he keeps close to you and that you bring people alongside of him to fill him up again and again. Bless your church, Lord God, that we might be a blessing to the world, that we might bring in those you are calling home Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Why don't we all stand?